Okay, let's have a look at SN1 reactions. And uh, before we dive into it, it's worth just unpacking what SN1 stands for. The S is for substitution. The N is for nucleophilic. Uh, we'll come to that shortly. And the 1 means that one species is involved in the rate determining step. So let's have a look at an example and see if we can work out uh, what's going on. So it's important to know SN1 reaction mechanisms are favoured by tertiary halogenoalkanes. So you'll notice in this case, uh, what makes it tertiary? Well, if I look at the carbon bonded to my uh, halogen, it is surrounded by three other carbons, uh, which makes it tertiary. And that's going to be important for a step in a moment. So what's the uh, first part of the process here? Well, I've got one molecule, uh, and what we find happening is that that one molecule um, undergoes some bond breaking. And to represent this bond breaking, uh, specifically the carbon-chlorine bond in this example, you'll notice that my arrow points from the bond, uh, and a two-pointed arrow, to the chlorine, meaning that both electrons in that bond are being taken by the chlorine. And why might this happen? Well, it's worth noting that chlorine is quite a lot more electronegative than the carbon, so it's pulling more strongly on those valence electrons. So what we are proposing happens without the influence of anything else is that bond breaks in what we call a heterolytic manner. So we call this process heterolytic fission because in this case, a different number of electrons are going back to the original atoms. Specifically, both electrons or two electrons are going to the chlorine and zero electrons are going to the carbon. Now, this first step happens to be the rate determining step or the slow step in my mechanism. And we can work that out experimentally and you might see that mentioned in another video. And because there's only one molecule, just this molecule involved in my rate determining step, we call this a unimolecular mechanism. Uni just meaning one molecule is involved in my rate determining step. Uh, and, and why might this be? It seems kind of quite unusual. Well, the problem here, if I were to represent the kind of size of my chlorine and the relatively large methyl groups around my carbon in the middle, their size means that they're effectively blocking anything from directly attacking that carbon in the middle. Uh, and we call this steric hindrance. So steric hindrance is simply referring to a lack of space for my molecule, or sorry, other molecules, to attack this molecule. So what happens once that um, heterolytic fission has occurred? Well, I'm going to end up producing two things. And you'll notice in this case, I've got a positive thing and a negative thing. And that's because both electrons in that bond have gone to just one atom meaning the chlorine has gained its own electron and also an extra electron, meaning it now has a negative charge. You can see that there. And my carbon has lost the electron that originally belonged to it, leaving my carbon with a positive charge. Now, a key piece of terminology here is that my positively charged carbon species is called a carbocation. And we call it an intermediate species because it is actually stable enough to exist on its own. We could, in theory, isolate it and uh, extract it from the solution. Now, carbon likes to have four bonds most of the time, so a positively charged carbon is unlikely to be very stable. However, in this case, it's helped by the adjacent carbons. So we've got one, two, three from our tertiary halogenoalkane. And because carbons are not very electronegative, they can actually donate electron density, and I can represent that with a little arrow, to stabilise that positive charge. In effect, the electrons from those carbons are going to be pulled towards the positive charge and decrease its intensity. Now, a key piece of terminology to uh, describe that effect is uh, the positive inductive effect which simply means that adjacent carbons to the positive carbon are uh, stabilizing that positive charge. 
Now, what we haven't drawn yet is our uh, nuclear foil. So uh, in this case, we would be doing a reaction perhaps with sodium hydroxide, meaning that floating around in my solution as well are negative hydroxide ions. And in this case, as soon as I've got a negatively charged species and a positively charged species, they're going to be attracted towards each other. So what I'm going to do, I want to represent the formation of a bond going from the lone pair of electrons on my oxygen uh, to the carbon in my carbocation. Now, in theory, the chlorine could also reform a bond with the carbon, but the actual step we're most interested in is the bond formed when that oxygen is attracted to my carbon. Now, because my hydroxide ion has a negative charge and is being attracted to a positive thing, we can describe this as nucleophilic attack, where my hydroxide is the nucleophile. It is kind of nucleus loving or positive charge loving. Therefore, it forms a bond with my carbon. Uh, and once that happens, well, we end up with our final products. We have now produced a tertiary alcohol uh, for the same reasons as my uh, halogenoalkane was described as tertiary. If I look at the carbon bonded to my hydroxyl group, the OH group, it's surrounded by three other carbons. So as well as producing a tertiary alcohol, we have also produced the chloride ion floating around in my solution. And it's important to mention that um, in exam questions. It hasn't disappeared, it's just floating around in the solution on its own. So there are my two products. And you'll notice going back to the SN1 bit that my chlorine on the original molecule has been replaced or substituted by a hydroxide. Uh, to form an alcohol. For that reason, this is called a substitution reaction. The N, which we said referred to nucleophilic, is to do with the nucleophilic attack of my hydroxide ion. And the 1 goes right back to the beginning where we talked about this being a unimolecular mechanism because in my rate determining step, which is the first step, we've just got one molecule. So the final bit of information that we're going to need to know about is to do with the choice of solvent to encourage an SN1 reaction. Uh, and for SN1 reactions, if we want that particular mechanism to occur, we find that polar protic solvents are best. Polar meaning they must be polar molecules or have a permanent dipole. And protic meaning they can form hydrogen bonds, which probably indicates that they are very, very polar. So some examples could be water, could be ammonia, could be methanol, something like that. And the reason we like to choose polar protic solvents for this kind of mechanism is because they're very good at stabilizing ions or solvating ions, meaning that my polar protic solvent molecules will surround the ion with their kind of um, partially charged side uh, and therefore stabilize them and there's two things we kind of want to stabilize here firstly we want to stabilize the carbocation intermediate because the more stable that is the more likely it is to be formed in the solution and to prevent any nucleophiles from attacking in the first step these polar protic solvents actually solvate or surround my nucleophiles so that they are not able to attack in the first step and have to wait for a positively charged carbocation to be formed before they are attracted towards it uh, and there's a bit less steric hindrance for them to attack. So those are some of the key terms related with SN1 mechanisms. Uh, hopefully this video was of some help.